your mic when you're not speaking, if you wouldn't mind. Um, and you can participate during the session by either using the chat to ask questions, uh, raise your hand if you wish to speak, and there'll be uh, folks here monitoring that. Um, and we've got a, uh, a Google Doc underway, which I've got the URL in that presentation, and I think Quentin will, will soon put that in the chat if he hasn't done so already. Um, so uh, we ask that you be kind um, in, in uh, your use of chat and not use it for any nefarious purposes. Um, humor is welcome, so please uh, be as funny as you wish. And refer to you to the code of conduct. Um, um, and if you uh, um, do not adhere to that code of conduct, um, you may be removed from the chat altogether. And we may disable the chat if that's not um, used as the best way it could be. Um, so um, what you are now participating in um, is a task group um, within the, an interest group. Um, and this particular task group uh, is called People in Biodiversity. And the conveners for uh, this task group are myself, David Shorthouse, Quentin Groom, you want to wave, Quentin? There you are, Anne Thesson, who joined us. Uh, and Elspeth. Um, and as you see at the bottom there, I've put in our ORCID identifiers. Um, these are our identities. So here's the, the agenda, I, what we hope to do um, wherever you are in the world. It's very early in the morning for me, lunchtime for many of you and supper time for others. But what we hope to do um, is give a, a brief overview of the attribution interest group. So the, the mother group and the mother organization of what this particular task group is all about. So I'll set the stage and give you some contexts and tools and some outputs and services. Describe the relationship between TADWIG and the Research Data Alliance, or RDA. Um, and what I hope to do with this is uh, kind of establish the scope. Um, and if you were to land on the TADWIG website and have a look at this particular interest group, um, there's no conveners listed. So one of the things that I hope to do um, towards the end of part way through this agenda, as I give a, a description of what this attribution interest group is all about, is to um, open up the floor a little bit and, and think about the scope of this particular interest group and then maybe even consider who ought to be the conveners. Um, and then I'm going to, afterwards going to dive down a little bit deeper into the specifics of this particular task group and review the People and Biodiversity Charter um, that was submitted in January of, um, I guess it was this year, um, and give you a sense of our progress, um, what we've been doing, or what we have tasked ourselves to do, um, and uh, give a demo of some of the stuff that we've been doing uh, to give you a flavor of where we're headed. And, and then plan for an exit strategy. So we would like to have this particular task group come to a close. Um, and there are a number of items in there that are outstanding. Um, and I, if you've been browsing through that Google spreadsheet, or the Google sheet, um, pardon me, Google Doc, as, as I've been speaking, you'll notice towards the bottom of that Google Doc, there's a, a number of um, a sharing wall that I've put in there for us to consider um, participating in um, in completing some of those tasks that are that remain outstanding and then towards the end um, plan for future work and there's one particular item that I think might be of interest to a number of you is um, thinking about um, how to assemble a, a manuscript about um, best practices in disambiguating agents um, in, in the data that we have so first, let's set the stage, the attribution interest group. Well, this was launched, if, if I can remember correctly, way back in early 2016. Um, and this was an attempt to try and find an alignment between uh, two major organizations, the Research Data Alliance and the Biodiversity Information Standards, or TADWIG, uh, try and find some crosswalks among these particular organizations that had some shared interests. And it was Anne Thesson, Matt Woodburn, who I believe is here with us, and Demetrius Curius, who were chaired that particular working group within TADWIG, which is comparable to a task group in TADWIG. 
And the working group was entitled the RDA Tadwig Metadata Standards for Attribution of Physical and, um, my screen is obliterated here, Physical and Digital Collection Stewardship Working Group. Um, and from Tadwig's perspective, I put the URL away at the bottom there for where our home is, Tadwig. So what's this attribution interest group all about? Um, and it helps me to think about um, the scope of this particular interest group by thinking about what are the drivers? What, what are the major factors in that might um, allow, you know, allow us to begin thinking about what attribution really means and, and the scope uh, behind that? And one of the papers that I always refer to in this particular um, way of thinking is uh, one put out by Lucinda McDade and her colleagues in uh, 2011 in bioscience. Um, a collective whinge, if you will, on the part of biologists who, who desperately need a, a modern assessment system for their professional productivity. Unlike a lot of other disciplines where money and papers really drive that kind of modern you know, assessment and of productivity, there are a whole suite of other kinds of activities that biologists are engaged in that don't participate in this whole sphere as much as we would like them to um, in, in how we get assessed, especially in you know, academic uh, uh, environments um, and taxonomists in particular produce a whole suite of products that um, we never really ever get considered in things like um, uh, merit increments or tenure. Um, so are there other ways that we can try and lift up um, the kinds of products that biologists produce uh, in a way that would um, expose the expertise that we have within our community? So that's, that's kind of well, that's one driver. Another one is a bit more um, obtuse, a bit more bottom up, and that, and that is more of a, a, a technical driver. Uh, and I put this slide here um, as a reminder to myself that dealing with personal names in our databases is really, really messy. I mean, you, we all deal with these name strings for agents, if you will, in one form or another. And it spans all of our disciplines, all our human endeavors, and it is extremely challenging. Um, and the, so one driver is a, um, an informatics kind of driver. We're dealing with these messes. We need to find solutions to deal with them in a way that is um, um, as universally uh, shareable as we possibly can, as we possibly can make them. Um, and yet another kind of driver um, is a paper produced by uh, Nikki Nicholson and her colleagues has, who, who have done a, a remarkably um, interesting job of using name strings for individuals or the representations as collector numbers, for example, in botany um, with a particular purpose. And that is to examine how, in this case, herbaria um, might be related to one another in, um, in the way and the kinds of blends of data that they have. And that diagram that I'm showing here on the right um, is a signal to those collection managers in Herbaria that perhaps there ought to be a bit more effective networking um, if there had not yet been effective networking among these Herbaria because there are some commonalities in the kinds of signals in their data um, brought forth when you look at the uh, individuals in the particular data fields, you know, the collectors, um, and as a way to um, illustrate that um, we ought to be knocking on our neighbor's doors a bit more effectively because there's an opportunity here to share data um, that might not have been um, fully appreciated. Um, and in particular with, you know, the sharing of, um, of duplicate specimens in, in botany. But the same is true in, in entomology and other disciplines. And, and finally, um, the driver that always sits kind of close to, and dear to my heart is, is the notion that we are all human. Um, and, and what I mean by that is that um, we all are desperate for ways to tell stories. 
Um, it's not sufficient in our community to be producing data and sharing it out in the wild without necessarily having the capacity to, to tell a story and to give some context um, to what it is that we do. Um, at some point in your life, if you've not done it before, you'll be engaged in writing things like obituaries for your loved ones, your colleagues, and finding ways to celebrate their impacts. And we ought to have the capacity to do these kinds of things with the data that we've got um, a bit more effectively. Um, we also, as a community, tend to, you know, time and time again, as new initiatives get launched, um, are desperate for ways to find experts within our community to showcase our own capabilities and our accomplishments and to find ways to come up with effective ways to award our peers for, you know, for the impact and the work that they've, that they've accomplished. Um, and, and finally, if we are in the business of linking the digital traces to people, um, as a, we ought to also be very respectful um, about the, uh, um, the potential downstream unintended consequences of doing these sorts of activities. Um, be very mindful of, of the ethics behind um, doing this kind of work of linking a, a person um, to, to um, for example, their specimen data or either, any other kind of digital traces that they might have left behind. Um, and interestingly, on Twitter, just the other day, um, Melissa Klein asked a question, and her question was, why is it that um, ORCID, one of the leading organizations that are in the business of assigning identifiers to researchers, why is it that we can't um, self-assign our gender on ORCID in the same way that we would declare our publications and link them to our ORCID account, our affiliations, why not these other kinds of corollary information about ourselves. And Melissa had a particular use case, and that is that she wanted to um, examine gender inequities in academia. And she also had another use case that she mentioned in her tweet stream, and that was um, she would love the ability to um, put name tags on folk when they attend conferences um, to, um, you know, for people to self-declare um, 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 uh, their pronouns. Um, why, why can't we do that via ORCID? And ORCID's response was rather interesting. I said, thanks for reaching, Melissa, reaching out to us, Melissa. Um, we're not in the business of um, putting information like um, uh, gender uh, on, in our accounts. And for more information, go see our trust pages. That's kind of a, an interesting response. Um, and we ought to be mindful of these kinds of additional bits of information about individuals that may or may not be used for um, um, particular valid reasons like Melissa, which she had in mind, but there could potentially be unintended consequences. And so ORCID's response is, thank you, we're not going to be doing that. So, um, the attribution interest group in Tadwig. Um, I've been thinking about this um, and trying to give us some kind of sense of scope of what its particular role is and what its whole um, cloud and sphere of activities might be. So we might think of um, it as we having to be responsive to ethics. You know, are we in the business of designing metrics for people? Um, is that something that we would consider ever doing in this, in this context with Tadwig? Um, Nonetheless, I think we ought to be mindful of the notion that if we are going to be assigning people to their, their digital traces or attributing them, that there will be the inevitable you know, metricization of those kinds of activities. Um, there's some overlap in this interest group um, with other interest groups, such as the data quality interest group. Um, maybe we ought to be making recommendations, uh, best use combinations of external data to detect issues in data quality. And I like to think about this as um, metadata standards for the misattribution <laughs> of physical and digital collections. Do we need a standard for that? Um, other kinds of coordinating activities with other groups um, that might have a notion of what an agent might be. Uh, an agent writ large might be a person, an organization, or even a 
piece of software, for example. Uh, so this has some kind of overlap and interest um, by Jeebus Registry of Scientific Collections, DISCO and Elvis in the European Loans and Visit System, so I have an interest in agents. Um, and likewise, the developers of collections management systems ought to be informed of whatever emerges from this group. Um, other aspects might include things like um, developing specifications or benchmark data sets or test suites and tools and services. You know, how do you parse the parts of people's names? Um, how do you search for people's names? What are those parts? Um, and resolving and reconciling people's names, what are the inputs that are most informative to do that kind of work? And finally, um, we ought not to forget uh, the very distinct possibility that um, by opening up our data to um, a new trajectory, uh, a new way of exposing our data, uh, this engages a whole suite of new community of folk that we might not ever have considered. Um, so that, you know, this has obvious tie-ins with citizen science, the history and philosophy of science, and enthusiasts engaged in the business of linking resources together because they might be coming at it from a perspective of uh, people as opposed to taxa. And so there are, there are champions in our midst that, that are, um, come from um, multiple backgrounds and multiple perspectives that are um, really adept at doing this kinds of linking work. Um, and I have a, a handful of folk here um, that have been very actively engaged in doing this kind of work. Um, and um, it's in our best interest to do everything we possibly can to engage folk like this because they are the engines behind um, um, making good progress. Oh, pardon me. So this kind of leads me to um, a reminder that um, Tadwig has a second part to it, and that is um, um, the 19th to the 23rd of October. Um, and the theme for this second part of the conference um, is integrating data from local to global solutions. Um, there's a long tail to the unknown agents in our community. Um, and the only way that we can kind of get a grasp on that long tail of unknown agents is in a, in a hyper local context. And yet it has um, um, very immediate um, impact on, on the global scale. So I think this particular task group and the interest group itself um, ties in very nicely with this particular theme. And I'm anxious to see what emerges from that in the, in the conference um, next month. Um, so I'm gonna open this up to the floor um, for about five, 10 minutes or so. And I will allow you to you know, raise your hand, um, think about this in a, in, a, in a collective way before we dive down into the task group. Um, this attributes an interest group in Tadwig is it appropriately named and scoped? Should it continue as an interest group? Is there anything missing? And what problems remain unsolved, but could be nudged um, in the way of development of additional standards? Hopefully these questions aren't too meaty. Um, and I'll leave it up to Quentin um, or others to um, allow people to speak. So people can put their hands up or if we don't speak over ourselves, also uh, just uh, speak out. Keeping my eye on who's got their hands up. Oh, I see uh, Damiano has got his hand up actually. He's just waving. <laughs> you need to unmute yourself, Damiano. It was a test to see. Ah. <laughs> Well, I, I can't raise my hand uh, as a host, but uh, anyway, I'll just interject. Um, so David, one of the things about uh, the name, so you say attribution interest group, your introduction seems a little broader than just attribution. And so I don't know if we need something that's wider, whether we just scope it to people uh, or something about, you know, that just talks about your human. Um, 
instead of focusing, I mean, attribution is a core piece of the business for sure, um, but maybe it isn't wide enough. Just my thoughts. I also think that um, it, it could, I mean, if, if we have enough energy to keep it going as an interest group would be useful. Uh, we've already, already had interest from the collection description uh, task group about how to deal with uh, people within uh, collection descriptions. Um, and at the moment, the task group's really just dealing with the people that uh, on labels, on specimens, and there are many other places uh, people information comes in. And uh, my big interest and in, uh, with people uh, is not really from a very human perspective. It's because I really want to link different kinds of data together uh, in, across biodiversity. And people happen to be one of the most stable entities in that and have the most stable identifiers. E even with all the problems of person identifiers, uh, it's still more stable than, say, a biological taxonomy, for instance. Any other hands up there, Quentin? Sorry, I can't see it from my own. Yeah. Nikki, oh, Nikki sorry, has Nikki. her hand yes. up. Nikki. Go ahead, Nikki. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's about the division between the interest group and the task group. I mean, naively, I would have flipped them in that people in biodiversity data seems to be a, a really big generic kind of topic which would suit an interest group. And attribution seems rather a concrete task within that, which might be a task group. Does that? make sense to anyone i think it kind of reflects what james just just contributed a moment ago yeah it makes absolute sense to me yeah is there a yes. mechanism for flipping <laughs> <laughs> yeah let's just do it <laughs> i think we just do it <laughs> well at this at the moment this is an interest this is a task group under a different interest group i can't remember which Observations. I'm looking to David. What, what are you trying to say there, Quentin? <laughs> well, there isn't a, there isn't an, a people interest group at the moment. We would have to no. set one up through the that big exec. That's correct. Um, at the moment, we're working as a task group under the observations uh, interest group. Who, who is our particular task group that we're speaking yes. about right now? We are under the attribution interest group. Oh, are we? Okay, yes. then there is one. Okay, then I'm <laughs> completely wrong. You were the <laughs> convener. Embarrassing myself. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a few things to remember. Yeah. All right. Well, I, I, that, that was helpful for me. Um, um, and I think maybe in the interest of time, we'll move on. We'll, we'll, we'll dig down now into the task group. Um, so, um, where this task group emerged. Um, there were a whole number of workshops um, that led up to this particular one uh, that you see on the screen. Um, but this one is what launched the task group. Um, there was a pre-conference workshop on entitled the authority management of people names and the organizers for that were Quentin, Elspeth, and I couldn't recall whether there were other organizers. Um, and if, if I've neglected anyone there, then I'm, I'm deeply apologetic. Um, this happened um, before the conference of biodiversity next for a full day and it was exhausting, um, but we split up into some very effective groups and we um, talked about and the visualization of people, primarily people and primarily in collections data. Um, how do you disambiguate people? How do you engage with folk um, with a dissemination of identifiers for people? Uh, and it was very worthwhile. And one of the um, here's a whole list of all the participants were there, very nicely attended and, and, a, and, a, and a lovely picture of all the folk that were in attendance. Um, and some of the outcomes for that particular workshop um, in Biodiversity Next. Um, in my mind, um, the timing was absolutely perfect um, because there are many other initiatives throughout the world and many other people to collaborate with that are solving these kinds of problems of dealing with identifiers for people uh, and linking um, in a very effective way. And it's nice to take advantage of, of everyone else's thoughts uh, and progress. Um, 
we made one particular statement and one outcome during that workshop in that um, we ought to use identifiers for people, but there's no one size that fits all. Um, and we're not going to be in the business of declaring one better than any other. Um, and that if you, you know, tag your data with any of these kinds of identifiers for people, agents, wonderful. Um, and one in particular, Wikidata, we don't as a group tend to think of that as an authoritative source for identifiers, but rather a, a universal resolver um, or reconciler, depending on how you might want to use it, um, of other kinds of identifiers. And for that reason, it, it's very special. Um, and the other outcome is that we need to engage more people. So that's kind of what we're doing at the moment. And we need a Tadwig task group. This is why we're here. Yeah. So we submitted a charter um, for a new task group under the uh, attribution interest group, Quentin. <laughs> um, and that was submitted in January of this year. And we have two homes. Um, one is on the Tadwig website proper. And the other one is in GitHub. And we have 12 to-do items. One for every month of the year, I suppose. It was a nice round number. And I have a little note to say that we're almost done, which is the reason why we need to come up with an exit strategy. Um, and since then, since January, we've had monthly virtual meetings, um, relatively well attended. Uh, on the last couple of ones, I neglected to wake up and participate in <laughs> some of them. <clears throat> but um, we make good progress. Um, here is the member list of our task group. Um, you might recognize some familiar names. And here's our to-do list, all 12 of them. And I kind of paraphrase them in the interest of making it sensible, in, in, in my mind at least. First one is to have a very hard look at some of the other Darwin core terms that make some kind of mention of a person or an agent. And so these things might look familiar to you if you've been attending some of the other TED Week sessions recorded by, identified by, georeferenced by, measurement determined by. Um, another one is to establish an extension to Darwin Core, assuming that there are some aspects to those other kinds of Darwin Core terms that might be deficient in some way. Maybe we need to uh, be more expressive in how we come up with ways of attributing people to the actions that they execute. Establish a vocabulary of terms and we'll anchor those to URIs from uh, an ontology called Vivo. We'll be ambitious, so we'll try and translate some of these definitions in multiple languages. Hopefully we could do some of that today. Um, uh, we would like to reconcile uh, the extension with other extensions that already exist in Darwin Core. Um, that's gonna be quite challenging. I'll get into that in a moment pilot the implementation of two to three museums in Herbaria that have an integrated publishing toolkit that might be interested in serving um, agent data uh, in, in this way. We'll put the extension on GBIS registry because that's tend to be where extensions to Darwin Core go. Um, and we'll advocate the use of global unique identifiers or persistent identifiers for people. Um, another kind of ambition that we had was to seek kind of uh, relations with <clears throat> ORCID or ISNI, and maybe we ought to have some kind of formal relationship with those entities. And so let's write a three to four page rationale on, on seeking membership and what that might look like with those organizations to keep um, a signal to them that we are very interested in their activities. We would like to write a best practices guide on how to disambiguate people, uh, particularly on specimen data, and identify areas of overlap with other interest groups in Tadwig, and make some recommendations on how to improve our workflows in whatever context those might be. So 12 tasks and progress has been made on most of them, but, but not all of them. Here is um, one of them to do uh, number eight in our list, uh, a paper that is in production. It has a DOI, it has a landing page, but it's not yet published. Um, and we've made a, a, a statement in this paper um, about the value of linking people to biodiversity data. 
And so it was a, a bit of an opinion piece and database that will be emerging soon. One of the figures that we put in that paper on the right hand side here is an interesting one. Um, it's kind of the reverse of what I normally see as a, as a collector's curve, for example. Here is sort of the, the opposite, um, where it seems as if <clears throat> on the x-axis way at the bottom, number of agent strings linked in the millions. This data comes from GBIF, download all of GBIF specimen data. Um, and then the cumulative specimen linked on the y-axis. And what this tells you is that there's a sort of an inflection point around 80%. And so um, if you link 80% of the agents, um, it turns out that the vast majority of the specimens um, are covered. That's kind of interesting. So there is obviously a very, very long tail up towards the right-hand side of unknown agents, but um, it tends to be that we have some superstar collectors or superstar determiners across our community um, that um, have done the lion's share of, of collecting and determining specimens. Which I find kind of interesting. It'd be, you know, it'd be interesting to kind of take this one step further and is there a temporal component to this? Has collecting decreased over time? Um, um, as, the, as the way, you know, the way in which that many communities have, have noticed is that true? Anyway, um, so he, here's our overlap and our relationship with RDA, or the Research Data Alliance. Um, and so in, in, our, in our bid to try and find an alignment with RDA, um, um, Anne Thesson led this paper in collaboration with Matt and Demetrius and Deb Paul and Mike Conlon, myself and Sarah Randine. Um, a, um, a very basic metadata schema uh, about attributing um, people um, to um, entities in, in our domain. And the diagram for that is on the right. So you have an entity generated um, by uh, an act, you know, generated by an agent way down at the bottom through some form of an activity. And that activity has a start and an end time and a reason. Um, and that agent, through the process of executing that activity, um, had a role specific to that context. So it's not a role in an administrative sense, but role in the context of executing that activity. So very simplistic um, schematic of the kinds of uh, the spheres of activity that, that, you know, that, that we care about, you know, the groupings of all these kind of classes, if you will. So those of you who who might be familiar with the W3C web annotation um, model and vocabulary and protocol will immediately realize that, you know, there's some kind of overlap in the, some kind of conceptual way about you know, what this might be in terms of annotation. Um, and if you dig down into the data model for web annotations, you see some obvious overlap. You know, over on the left, we've got a creator or an agent. And so there's an identifier for the agent. It's a type person. Um, over on the right, there might be some motivation and purpose for annotating a particular item. Um, and so you notice that these are expressed as verbs. So in a motivation bookmarking or purpose tagging. Um, and so that there might potentially be some um, um, very um, strong overlap between the W3C web annotation and what we're proposing here. Um, so they're, they're not counter to one another. I think they can complement one another very well. Um, so some other kind of motivation instances that would occur within the W3C web annotation model or other verbs, assessing, bookmarking, classifying, commenting, describing, identifying, etc. So um, one of our tasks in our to-do number two, let's make an extension to Darwin Core. And here's a reminder for folk of what um, a Darwin Core archive looks like. Um, in the middle, we've got this um, core set of terms and some data associated with it. So this is, a, you know, the Darwin core terms you'd find smack dab in the middle. And hanging off it in a one-to-many relationship are all these various extensions. So you might be extensions for species profile, distribution, references, vernacular names. And so what we're proposing is that there be another um, line within this 
uh, sphere of kinds of extensions to Darwin Core, and one for agents and their actions. In parallel to what we were thinking of, of doing um, in this extension, GBIF have come up with two terms, um, sort of on the sly. These are not official Darwin Core terms, but Darwin Core has not been ratified to accommodate these new terms, but rather they're in the GBIF namespace as a, as a sort of playground for those who do have an IPT or integrated publishing toolkit and are publishing their data out to the wild and making it accessible to GBIF and others. Um, can we do this in a very simplistic way? So, you know, not necessarily dig down deep and have a full-fledged extension, but for those that might be sharing their data in, in spreadsheets, um, can we um, supplement recorded by with a list of identifiers, um, you know, identifiers in the sense of uh, global unique identifiers like, like ORCID identifiers or Wikidata entities um, as an expression of all those folk that might have been responsible for uh, collecting a specimen or um, are responsible for that, um, observing that occurrence. Um, and likewise, the, the complement for that other one, other term identified by is identified by ID. So the same sort of, the same sort of thing, you know, a, a string of identifiers separated by pipes if there are multiple identifiers. So in production now, you can make use of these terms uh, if you do publish your data out through the integrated publishing toolkit um, and GBIF's product. Um, so that doesn't necessarily um, get in the way of thinking about this um, in terms of a Darwin Core Archive extension, but nonetheless, it's, it's another option. Um, so what might an extension look like? And we've given this a name, the Agent Actions Extension. And in essence, I have in quotations here um, what this really entails. Who is the agent? What did they do? And when did they do it? And optionally, what was their role in the context of executing that action? And we've organized ourselves in GitHub and come up with some um, candidate terms for what might exist within this extension and some controlled vocabularies that might hang off some of those terms within that extension. Um, so, um, Quentin, if you wouldn't mind sharing that, if you can capture that um, and, and share that in the chat, I'll give you a moment to do that. So these are two projects in our GitHub uh, repository. One for the properties, um, that would be the terms within the extension, and the other for the, a particular vocabulary that describe the actions, um, and the actions being one of the properties in that extension. And so I'm going to do a demo before I tell you what these terms are, just to give you an idea of what this is like. Um, and I went fishing for some data, uh, and I found some data in the Canadensis IPT. Um, this was some data produced by Corey Sheffield and Kristen Palmier uh, in a paper that they published in Biodiversity Data Journal. Gosh, I forget when, but it must have been at least a couple of years ago. And special thanks here to Tim Robertson, who took our, our um, um, draft extension and, and put it in the GBIF repository of extensions, but only accessible in, for those IPTs that are in uh, test mode. Um, so let me see if I can end the show here and slip over um, to um, um, Palmier's and Sheffield's data. Um, now I've lost my window. Can I get somebody to vocalize that you can actually see the spreadsheet? We can. You can, excellent, good, okay. So here's some very typical data that you can see um, and as you, know, you, know, you would prepare to put into an IPT. Um, you've got the identifier on the left-hand side, it's a physical object, language, license, et cetera, et cetera. And the terms that we're, you know, that we're most interested in are columns that were recorded by, and he knows Corey here, he's got his name, co-collected this particular specimen with Darlin, a whole bunch of those, and here's Kristen Palmier, she collected other specimens. And I keep scrolling to the right, and you can see things like um, something else that might be, oh, here comes some coordinates, and here's georeferenced by, well, I said Corey has georeferenced some specimens, and likewise, so has Kirsten. Um, and identified by, 
Corey identified these and Kirsten identified those. And so, you, you know, I remind you that there are these terms identified by ID and recorded by ID that are in the GBIS namespace available in production now in your IPT. Um, what we don't have are georeferenced by ID. And, you know, there are other instances where there are people mentioned in Darwin core terms that, you know, measure, measure by, and I forget exactly you know, what that precise term might be in Darwin core, but there are other mentions of people. And do we want to have all these other additional terms georeferenced by ID, or um, might we be able to make use of this Darwin core extension in a, in a bit more subtle, but granular way um, to narrow in on the particular actions that folk undertook uh, in the course of collecting, georeferencing and identifying. And so this is what I've done here in this other sheet as I've, in essence, transposed and ripped apart what was inside that core and come up with uh, a way of representing Corey and Kirsten and Darylin um, and split them all up out in individual rows. And so who, what did they do? And um, what is their identifier? And what, what were the actions that they undertook within the, within the data set? So here I've got name, Corey, the action collected. And here I've got a term to display order to give a, an expression of the, the arrangement of names. And you, you recall that Corey collected with Kirsten or Cor, Corey collected with Daryl and I believe. And so you need a way to represent that ordering. Um, the ORCID identifier, oh boy. Um, for Corey, uh, it's a person and the, uh, the type of that identifier is an ORCID and it started at a particular time and ended at a particular time. Um, so what might this look like in, um, in an IPT? Well, pardon me, let's go over here. Mm. Here we go. So here, in a typical IPT instance, you load up your data and you map the columns to the data that you've got. And we've got this lovely extension now called Agent Actions available. Um, and you could do the same thing. And, and of course, yeah, it, it, it times out. I have to log back in again. So it's, it's no different than, than mapping any other extension in Darwin Core and in an IPT. And, and it would look like this. And all these other kind of terms that we're interested in. Uh, the type, it's a person versus an organization. The, the agent identifier type, it's an ORCID. Here's the identifier, the name, Corey Sheffield, et cetera. Other terms here that I haven't touched on yet, but here's the action tied to some kind of control vocabulary. The display order started at time, ended at time. So relatively simple. But the consequences of doing this is here is a very small data set, 24 records. When you rip it apart like this, and it's this very simple data set, and I've got 84 of them. So it might be a bit daunting, um, but we would assume that for those of you that have an agent's table in your collections management system, um, this may not be so daunting. You might have already agents in your collections management system. There might be a way to, to do this. So what we're really fishing for um, is some volunteers to kick the tires um, uh, and, and get a sense of what this is like and, and whether or not it's even feasible. So the terms now, what are these terms? Um, since January, we've been coming up with um, discussion points about uh, the pros and cons of particular terms within this um, extension. Um, the ones in red that I'm showing you here um, consist of controlled vocabularies. That's why I give them red. 
Um, and so these are all the terms, type, agent, identifier, type, identifier, name, verbatim name, additional name, alternate name, the action, the role within the context of executing the action, display order, start at time, end at time. That's it, relatively simple. We debated for quite some time about, you know, including other kinds of portions of people's names. Um, and we've elected to strike out two given name and family name um, because these are very culturally insensitive. Um, although they're present in schema.org and we could have borrowed them, um, just like as probably what was discussed in the annotation, um, W3C annotation work, um, there you also only have name. Um, but we've elected to include a few more here for some reasons that are peculiar to our domain. And so some of these um, reasons might include uh, items like um, verbatim name, um, which may include appellations such as Mrs., Mr., Ms., Reverend, you know, all those kinds of additional qualifiers that might be very important in revealing the identity of individuals. Um, that we certainly could include in name, um, but oftentimes are not properly expressed in that way. Um, and now the, the other term down midway down at the bottom, identification ID, is our attempt to try and make a rather cumbersome link to an existing extension that is already in production in, in Darwin Core archives for the um, identification history extension, where two are included individuals uh, in identified by. Um, and so this is our attempt to try and make some kind of cross linkage, even though that was never explicitly designed for in that star scheme of the Darwin Car Archive to, to do that in hopefully <laughs> not too difficult way. And there are only three required terms in this extension, type, name, and action. Interestingly, we've decided that identifier, you know, the ORCID identifier, or the Wikidata identifier is optional. Um, and some concepts for the control vocabulary, agent identifier type. Um, we've got a few of them here that we are familiar with. ORCID, ISNI, IPNI, Wikidata, VIAF, um, ROR, uh, the research organization, whatever it stands for, <laughs> Ringgold and GRID. And so ROR, Ringgold and GRID are for organizations and the others are typically used for people, but may also be used for organizations. So we have this notion of a, an agent type um, being a bit more expressive than merely people. Uh, and concepts for the property role. And here we're borrowing from the OBO contributor role ontology, um, trying to get at what is commonly done in botany. Um, and that is a, a need to express the, a primary collector or other participants that might have been included in recorded by that are not the primary collector, um, but were in the party. And the action, and this is the one I think is, is most interesting. Interesting. Here, here's the control vocabulary for the action property. Um, and we intend to borrow from Vivo, uh, another ontology for expressing um, these kinds of things. Um, and we've come up with a handful of them. Verified, transcribed, prepared, measured, georeferenced, identified, observed, and collected. Some of these overlap, as you can see with the existing terms in Darwin Core, georeferenced, identified, um, and observed and collected. So what are we going to do? It's now um, midway through, and my intention and hope is that we have a look at this Google Doc um, that uh, is, should be within the chat. And Quentin, if you wouldn't mind including that again. Um, to come up with some better term, better definitions for some of these terms that we've proposed. And the one that I'm most interested in is um, the actions definitions. They are, for the most part, 
tautological and nonsensical, <laughs> and they really need to be tied in, and tied down to something that is in English, and preferably also in other languages. So if, if you're coming from other places in the world, um, I would dearly love you to um, uh, do your best at, at attempting to come up with some of these definitions in your language or other in languages that you know, um, such that we can be as, in, as inclusive as we possibly can in, in going forward. Um, and also um, towards the bottom half of uh, the Google Doc um, is a sharing wall. Um, this is kind of my attempt to um, engage folk who might have expertise in particular areas um, and would be putting that on offer uh, or those that might have challenges with particular aspects of dealing with agents um, in their um, in their sphere of interests um, that are, are desperate for some help. Um, if I can flip over to that Google Doc um, myself and show you what I mean. Uh, let's kind of zoom in a little bit so that we can see the text on my screen here. Thank you very much, folk, for putting your list, your name on the list of attendees. This is wonderful. Here, at the, towards the uh, bottom of that page, we've got agent actions extensions to Darwin Core. Here are the properties, and I put links to our GitHub issues where you can have a sense of what some of the discussion points have been. In bright green here, um, if you notice that there's some ambiguity or uncertainty, or maybe you have um, some other term that you would desperately like to see within these core sets of terms, um, please add them in here. Uh, and the control vocabularies. We've got some list of things that we knew about. If you think of other agent identifier types, I'll start throwing them in there. Um, and here's the ones that I'm interested in here, as trying to nail down some of these definitions um, is the, the definitions for the particular actions that we care about. Um, and think about these in, in sort of the potential downstream usages of these actions. Um, are, you know, while doing this, think of, is there a need for these things? Um, have we missed some? Um, and do your best to find a way to come up with a better definitions that, than what we've come up with here, like prepared prepared the subject. <laughs> it hardly seems particularly useful. Um, measured, georeferenced, identified, observed. So I've blasted out all these GitHub issues here and I put in their definitions as they stand within GitHub and they're not, they're not production ready by any sense of the, the imagination. Uh, but if you've got more actions that you think in expressed as a verb that you think we're missing here, um, please add some. Um, the property role and its control vocabulary. Uh, we've got primary collector role or specimen collection role. This has always been kind of difficult within our group to express what role really means. And as I mentioned earlier, it's not in the administrative sense. It's in the sense in the context of doing, of executing particular action. Um, and it, as you can see, it's very, very specific to specimens. Um, what happens um, when we start um, sharing data out that might emerge from, say, um, iNaturalists that might be interested in using this extension? Are there roles there that we ought to be mindful of? And here's the sharing wall, the bottom of this doc. Um, and I've got a template for you, and I was hoping that you might be able to kind of copy bits and pieces out. Say, I want help on versus I can help you with um, and put your name if you are proposing to help on a particular topic or you are in need of a particular help uh, um, solution and put your name as a requester. So copy that out or copy that out, paste it down below. And I've seeded a few of these things in here. Um, and I hope that you might um, engage um, in, in coming up with uh, an expression of what you would like to see happen or you are putting yourself on offer and because you can do certain things and you and you and you would you'd like to help others try and come up with a solution so there are two 
from the perspective of this task group um, that are most important. One of which is I would like help on test driving the Darwin's Court Archive Agent Actions extension in an IPT in test mode. Um, and the expectation is that you have an IPT or you, um, you have access to an IPT in test mode. Um, you have a collection space data set to add. Some might be large, some might be small. Maybe you have a relational database. Um, and you're willing to participate in the authorship of a paper that we want to submit to BIS um, as this begins to develop. So that, that's the carrot <laughs> that you can um, try and engage with our, our group. And another one is, I would like help on writing a statement about membership with ORCID and or ISNI. Um, so if you have interacted with um, the ORCID steering group um, um, within your organization and you've gone through those kinds of steps and know what it's like to seek membership in ORCID, um, it would be lovely if you might um, put your hand up here um, and offer us support. Um, and drafting a three to four page document about what that uh, would entail for Tadwig and what, what would be the benefits for Tadwig to um, seek membership in ORCID or ISNI. Because um, those items are in our task uh, list and we've, we've not yet tackled them, uh, ta that particular one um, um, in any great extent. Um, so any questions on what we're about to do? Don't see any hands up. I wondered if um, you, you you briefly mentioned iNaturalist, and I just wondered if you could point out to people where they can put their orchid into iNaturalist, because maybe some people haven't discovered that. And it's it's fairly recent. Um, I well, just... yes, I know that you can. I've not gone through the motions to having done that in my own iNaturalist account. I could um, show least... people where to do it just briefly. I mean, I, I'm distracting from what we're supposed to be doing. I know, but. Um, why don't I stop sharing? And if you want, if you want to do that, oh, it won't take me very long. Free reign. Uh, I can figure out which screen I need to share. So it's, you can see my screen, I guess. So we should preface this with, um, and then Tim Robertson, if you're there, um, we might confirm this. Um, but one of the drivers for um, the term recorded by ID is because um, iNaturalist, um, we're really interested in being able to share this kind of attribution, if you will. Um, and we're, we're, we're really wanting this kind of way of sharing out attribution in a relatively flat way. Um, and as Quentin is about to demonstrate, um, you can link your ORCID identifier um, to your iNaturalist account. So you, you should see the, the map of my own observations there, but you, you link to ORCID just here under account settings. And I'm already connected, but you can see it's, it says here, it says disconnect the ORCID. You would click on connect ORCID and then you would just uh, log, log into your ORCID account and then you're connected and that's all there is to it. And what that means is you can go into, into an energy BIF, put an ORCID ID into the recorded by ID and get everybody, uh, everyone who uh, has linked their iNaturalist records in here. So if I was to actually take my own, which I should have prepared, uh, well, I won't bother doing it, but you can see it there. Uh, effectively, because I have records in there from iNaturalist, but also for herbarium specimens from our own institution, I can see all of my records in one place at one time, uh, which wasn't possible anywhere before then. And that's it. It's good. I'm seeing some activity in the, in the Google Doc already. This is reassuring um, some of the identifiers that we're missing, HUH, research for ID.
So I would just like to make a statement, if I could, David. Okay. Um, so no one has to do anything about this right now, but I do want to make sure everyone is aware that in addition to this um, data model, we're also working on a larger data model that maps across different ways to reify this sort of attribution information um, in such a way that you can automatically make um, JSON or whatever your favorite representation is. And so the purpose of this is to be able to say that um, we'll be able to map across different databases that maybe model their data a little differently or use different vocabularies, especially in the context of trying to join data from different disciplines. For example, if we wanted to try to join biodiversity collections with archeological collections or with um, uh, other humanities type collections. And you don't have to, to worry about doing this right now just know that that's been started and um, we're hoping that that will help make it easier to walk across data models and across disciplines. Good. So Tim Robinson and, and Nikki Nicholson have been pointing out about the fact that iNaturalist doesn't yet use identified by, or you identified by ID, sorry. And uh, Tim has put a useful link in there to the, some of the discussions that have gone out, out around that whole concept. And I haven't read through it, but <laughs> it will. <laughs> it's useful that that's been discussed on the iNaturalist forum. So if, if, if I can summarize, you know, and, and I'm probably gonna you know, mess it up royally, um, is that what, what tends to happen on, on iNaturalist is that um, with this notion of research grade uh, data that would flow out to um, GBIF, um, there is a, a determiner or an identifier, if you will, but then there's a whole suite of folk um, that might be giving their, in essence, thumbs up. To, yeah, that's correct. That's good. Um, what do you do about all those folk <laughs> that have just been given a thumbs up to say, yes, that determination is correct. Um, do you blast all those out and send them in as identified by or merely the individual that came up with that initial, initial determination that then was subsequently verified? Um, uh, there are pros and cons of doing either one of those approaches. Um, and I think if, I'm, if I can um, put my, stick my neck out, is that there is an opportunity when this agent action extension, if I naturalist were interested in making use of an extension and not want, you know, just flat data, um, an opportunity to do that because it's really no different than what tends to happen um, in the rest of our specimen based data. You know, that mean an individual that would have identified something and a whole suite of other people that would have confirmed that, that determination. Um, and we, ought to have an opportunity to express that within this extension when we have identified versus verified. Tim is trying to get in here, yeah. Uh, David, I put a link to the uh, INATS forum in the chat here. Yeah. And the closing comment from the INATS technical staff is that as your agent's extension um, gains traction, they will look and consider using it um, for the purposes that you envisage. Good. So they're, they're open to the idea of using this um, well, while I have the, the mic, could I just make two points? Um, the recorded by ID and identified by ID were originally submitted as proposed terms in Darwin Core, and they sat there for a number of years. I think that was me. <laughs> no, it was me. I believe that was me, yeah, like about f f five years ago. Yeah. Okay, uh, I submitted them as well. Oh. The reason that they sat there is because Darwin Core is in this phase of clarifying when we should have uh, ID fields in the Darwin Core namespace and when we should use the IRI namespace. And uh, so that, that one's going around. 
What we have decided to do um, to satisfy the immediate needs, which did come from my naturalist, is we've created those two terms in a GBIF namespace. Now, I would imagine in the future they will move into a better home than the current GBIF namespace. So that, that's the first point. The second point is just to, to confirm to people that when the agent action extension does become um, in widespread use, uh, GBIF will uh, implement it. And that would mean that we would understand it, we would index the data, and we'll look to provide that in data downloads as well, which would help um, give motivation for why someone should actually map the data. Excellent. I think there was maybe Matt Blissett who made the point that also machines can do things and that we need to consider those in terms of the actions um, because maybe machines can do things that people aren't <laughs> going to be doing. Yes, um, you know, you know, one way of also thinking about that is do, do we want to give attribution to machines? Um, but nonetheless, um, I, I think it, it is wise to differentiate um, the type of agent. It's not just uh, it's not just credit. It's about um, provenance, and so I think you do have yeah. to give uh, the provenance to the machine yeah, <laughs> in some exactly. cases. Yeah. Where I'm unclear um, is when you do give um, declare you know, software, I suppose, um, as um, an agent type assuming it would be accommodated with this extension. What do you give the identifier for that software? Well, David, we kind of went around this merry-go-round a couple times in the context of RDA, which I'm sure you remember. And I think the, there were a couple of things that, that stood out. And one is that the machines are about provenance and we're working on attribution. So those are, those are two different things. So it's, a little bit out of scope. And the other was that um, we've got enough to do trying to get attribution to the people who actually need and care about attribution, whereas machines aren't trying to get promotions. So um, the, the consensus was we'll focus on this area, on at attributing people first, and then we'll maybe worry about provenance of software later. But that, that consensus may have changed since then. Um, I, I think it's sort of, I think of this as a kind of a progression. We've, we've not closed the door on that possibility um, by designing the extension the way we have, because it, it's, it's really very simple. Um, we have an opportunity to express an agent as a machine. Um, we've not closed that door. Um, and I think when and if that need arises, um, um, we'd certainly be able to accommodate that. But you're right. I mean, the motivation for this extension is not, not machines, um, but um, if there is a need to track that provenance, um, we could do so with this extension without hopefully <laughs> too much additional thought. Well, David, one, one use case there that I see is uh, identification by picture, right? So we're getting better at this, especially with animals. And so, yes, the machine's algorithms are making an identification, but those algorithms were generated by people. And so you probably do want to attribute a piece of software that was developed by someone with the intent of identifying things so that that person's software gets credit uh, and that person then gets credit for an amazing algorithm that identifies X taxa. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, um, now that James is saying that it's dawning on me that when we do these sorts of things in the other disciplines and projects that I work in, the, we don't necessarily attribute a piece of software, but we do tag the data as being machine generated or something. It's part of a, a quality tag or an evidence code or something of that nature. Um, I don't want to go down a rabbit hole here, but that's something else to think about, I suppose.
So I think um, it was number 10 on your list, or maybe 11, was creating best practice guide for uh, disambiguation. And we, we had a whole team working on that in the pre-conference workshop last year. And um, since then, I've made no progress on it whatsoever. Um, so you're right. I mean, I should, you know, we, we've got, I, we've got 15 minutes left. Um, we've had a little bit of activity um, in, in this Google Doc, and it's been very helpful. I've been looking at a few of these things, and I think we can take some pretty quick progress on some of these. It seems like we're still going to have to work on the definitions <laughs> a little bit more. Um, and also, I think one of the action items is for this task group to meet yet again um, and nail these definitions down as best we possibly can use a thesaurus dictionary, whatever it is that we need to be doing to come up with appropriate definitions. Um, um, but now that we've got these 15 minutes left, um, one of those items in our task list um, is to come up with um, an, um, an agenda or um, a, a strategy for that disambiguation paper. Uh, so Quentin, do you, would you like to describe what that process was like um, at Biodiversity Next and, and where you see it going and how we might engage folk here in that? I'm mentioning it because it's kind of a ticket on, it's been on my list for a long, long time. Um, we had, so we went through the process in Biodiversity Next, or at least our little disambiguation team of thinking all the possible sorts of information you can use for disambiguation. Um, and I think we have a pretty good idea what those might be. Um, things like, uh, I think you mentioned uh, people's prefixes and suffixes to their names and how important those are in disambiguating people. Um, issues about uh, de dates of birth, uh, dates of death and other important event dates and how we can link those to the um, specimen. But there's lots and lots of other sorts of information. Um, I think the difficult leap we've got now is how we can make those into best practices. And when we're linking specimen data, particularly things like collectors to identifiers, if we make a mistake, that's quite bad. Um, and it can have knock on effects, especially when we, if we want to use machines for linking things together to making mistakes in the future, because one, one mistake may, may reinforce further mistakes later on. So we need a high level of confidence that um, we're linking it to the, a person or a name st string to a, a, the correct identifier. Uh, and that hopefully that identifier only refers to one person and not multiple people. Um, so I'm saying all of this because I'm interested to know who out there in the, the group here today are interested in that kind of thing. I know there are a number of people out there that do that kind of linking and so understand some of the issues involved um, who might want to work on this best practice guide effectively. And while you were speaking, a sort of a tangential kind of statement made is that um, this business of linking from one entity to an agent, um, that in and of itself deserves some form of attribution in the sense that um, when you think of, you know, the digital specimen or the extended specimen has like all these potential links out to external resources that kind of express the breadth of knowledge that might be associated with that digital specimen or that digital object, um, you really need some form of a rationale or a, a, some kind of anchor of a statement to say why that link was made and may, maybe this is where you would draw upon the annotations work with W3C and say, who made that link? What was the rationale and the reason for making that link? Um, so that there's a piece of evidence that would give some verifiability, not merely that this thing is linked to something else, but you're not gonna have to do it over and over again and verify that that link is correct. So anyway, anyway, if anyone is interested in that, um, I'm fairly easy to get in touch with, <laughs> and uh, you can put something in the chat or something like that. 
Now, one of the things I'd like to see included in that paper, I don't know how we're going to address it, is um, what are the kinds of suites or the clouds of information in a particular context that are most informative in disambiguating people? I would assume that there's sort of a diminishing returns where you, you begin to throw on more bits of information and it's not going to help you disambiguate any more than we already did with some core pieces of, of facts um, that would uh, illuminate um, uh, and tie a particular agent string to an, uh, an identity um, more so than any other kind of associated information. And the kinds of things that I'm thinking of for co-collectors um, in the same way that in a, in a publication you'd have co-authors that would in most cases be extremely informative um, because people tend to collect together, tend to write papers together. I put a little bit in the chat, but uh, I really think that the provenance model sitting behind and the annotation um, standard could help us with this, would help us resolve potential bad matching. Uh, so if, if we make a poor assertion about someone being the collector or having done something, um, as long as we have a provenance model that uh, you know, is being tracked, then you should be able to resolve the fact that this was a bad assertion and that assertion should not be connected or should be able to be disconnected. Um, so we should keep, keep in mind that. Uh, but I would strongly say, I mean, the, the work that we did in the past on you know, data annotation as part of that W3C standard on annotation, that uh, what David showed earlier gives us an easy path for keeping track of the evidence and the motivation for doing things. And I, I think that's a really important concept talking about uh, keeping track of what people are doing. One of the items on my wish list as a requester was that um, I often see all kinds of, you know, speaking of annotations, little tidbits of tokens that are included along with people's names and they have some kind of meaning. Um, and they are very, very domain specific. Um, you know, things like stet, exclamation mark. Um, and there are other sort of comparable things, you know, that, that tend to be in botany, um, other comparable things that are in, in entomology. Um, all those kinds of little tokens and little bits of text that get included in recorded by or identified by time and time again. Um, they have some kind of obvious meaning. Um, I've come across a, um, a paper that I think it was um, Sabina shared with me, written in German. Um, but, and it was very specific botany, um, but it would be lovely to have some kind of compendium of these things. Um, and they would certainly inform a standard of some sort that somehow. So any of you have expertise or experience in dealing with these little bits and text um, that have meaning like that? Um, I'd be very keen on trying to develop some kind of little white paper. So we've got eight minutes. Um, any um, final thoughts across the bow? Um, can I come in? Um, I'm just thinking about the disambiguation paper, Quentin. So I've just put um, just to let everyone know, um, I didn't see it perfectly in there, so I've put something in there about uh, working on a best practice for disambiguation to build on earlier work. Um, I've put in that I can help, but it'd be great to get other people in putting in there and then we can pull that, that group together. Excellent.
In, in, in the course of building my pet project, Bionomia, which I um, obsess over far too much, <laughs> um, I, I, I've been really grappling with how best to search across human names, across a whole compendia and list of human names. It's really hard stuff. Um, and I think I've got it 80% of the way there, but this, this final 20% that is really kind of makes your life difficult. And you wouldn't expect this to be hard, but it is. There's a technical aspect to it that um, is really draining. <laughs> um, so I'd be pleased to share that with other folk that might be in the business of developing things like portals or aggregators um, that um, have contemplated doing this um, and, and might um, I'd be anxious to share some kind of what I've learned along the way. Um, and I'd be anxious to kind of receive some feedback on whether or not it's appropriate. So I can help with building a search index for human names. Right, I, I'm going to come in just very quickly. Um, what, what we're working on at the the Botanic Garden in Edinburgh, we're just uh, moving into a new piece of software for the collection management system. And what that's involving is um, bringing um, agents, which have been in completely separate tables in that earlier piece of software, our earlier database, into um, a single table. So what we're essentially doing is bringing agents from collectors, from staff, from um, donors, from I mean, all over the place. They're all in different tables currently, so we're bringing them all together. And so this is, this is you know, for us, it's hugely relevant. And the, essentially what we're going to have to do is a huge deduplication process as well. And, and that whole disambiguation of bringing all these different agents together into a single table. So it would also be interesting if other people have been having this experience as well, um, in a sim similar kind of very practical way as well. It'd be good to hear. I think all of us in one sh way, shape or form have um, a dirty bucket <laughs> of agents. Um, that is often extremely difficult to disentangle. Um, uh, and I think, you know, it, it would have clear utility um, across our whole domain. Well, certainly the process of linking people to their identifiers has been a, a very good cleanup exercise for us. Um, but that long tail you showed is super long. <laughs> and, uh, and some of them are just non-existent people and some of them are multiple people and you just don't know what's in there till you, till you actually go and figure it out. The, the real frightening thing is speaking of this human domain and this business of linking because there's kind of an unemotive value in doing this kind of work. Um, we have a very rapidly aging group of taxonomists um, and those are the folk that know who are in that long tail. Um, and so we've got to get cracking on this as quickly as we possibly can. But that long tail will persist indefinitely. And really encourage them to get ORCID IDs because Wikidata isn't ideal for a number of reasons. Uh, uh, Nick is pointing out some things in the chat. Um, ORCID IDs allow living people to look after their own identities and that's by far the best way of doing things. Um, doing it after they've died um, is not ideal. It's, it works, but it's not perfect. Right. Well, and, and one of the things I think, Quentin, you are doing that David's done an amazing job of is, you know, it's one thing to have the standards and the vocabularies and be organized, but it's another thing for those aging taxonomists to be given a platform on a computer that allows them to do something very simply and contribute that knowledge. Uh, so, you know, we really have to think about implementation as well and how do we motivate those people. And another piece of the motivation, which of course is something that they care about, is the credit of the work. So if, if we can motivate them in a way, it's to say, how can your credit and others that you, know, that you care about in your field uh, of expertise, um, it benefits them. So there's that, that carrot, but it has to be put in it, some kind of implementation that's easy for them. 
to use. Yeah, so I just put the link to Binomia in the chat because I, you've been very quiet about it, David, and uh, everyone needs to know about this. Yeah. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, is that, you know, it's one thing to put something together, but it's another to realize that there's um, a whole group of folk um, that um, have agency, speaking of agents, and are desperate to have agency and being able to do this work coming from a number of perspectives that um, we would not have ever considered. Um, the folk that are involved in um, tracing their family tree, uh, the genealogists, um, um, they are immensely engaged and, and very enthusiastic of doing these kinds of things. That's one thing that I, you know, it, it was a complete shocker to me. I had, I had no idea. That's a really nice thing about just kind of throwing something out there is that um, um, you tap into folk that um, love to do this kind of work um, and it's rewarding. Well, David, one of the things you and I had mused and, and looked at some of the software in the genealogy world, uh, and of course we saw, I think, a couple of examples where this was being done in science is, you know, the genealogy of the people, who trained who, who's connected to what, uh, based on the people, not even necessarily their institutions, but who touched who, and that might be a really fun way to engage uh, people. And there's, there's already some pretty robust software out there, um, so it's another angle to get people to sort of give us a history and, and to know who some of these people are and what their connections are. Yeah, that one's called the academic family tree. So Google that, um, and it's kind of fascinating. You know, we, we can do the same thing with specimens if we're really creative about it, you know? So-and-so collected with so-and-so, someone else identified those specimens. Who did that person then identify specimens with, et cetera, et cetera, all along the chain? And so you, you get uh, how many degrees of <laughs> separation are you from Darwin? <laughs> Quentin, didn't you calculate that once? Wasn't very far, but I can't remember. Anyway, so um, we are now at 7.30 in my time locally. Um, um, were we meant to go for another half hour? You, so you keep saying. Thought, I originally thought we were just an hour and a half, but now that I look at the schedule, it's two hours. But I think we've only really planned for an hour and a half's worth of. Yeah, and a, a, there's <laughs> a the vocabularies group is directly after this one, so we do have to finish a little bit early just to get a bit of yeah. uh, time for them to get themselves together. Yeah, my apologies. I think I misread the, uh, the schedule and I was assuming it was an hour and a half. I don't, you know, we didn't, I don't think we really had <laughs> two hours worth of work. So I think it's perfectly fine. Uh, neighbor started his truck. He's off to work. <laughs> um, so if, if people are, are fine with us departing early, um, that's okay by me. I'm fine with leaving early. Yeah, David, just to reiterate what Quinton's saying, that the plan was to have a gap between the two because we have to transfer over the uh, the host, et cetera, to the next. So you know, you can take a little more time. Maybe maybe a wrap up is good. But uh, if, yeah. if you leave us what 15 minutes or something, that should be enough for us to switch. Perfect. We've okay. already we've already got the um, the switch over cunningly planned, so you can okay. easily go right. another 15 if you want. Sneaky. Mm. Why don't you give us a live demo of how people use Bionoma Tracker? How people use it? Oh gosh. Hello. hello. I'll show hello, you how. Hello. Hello, Is may I interrupt you? Yeah, please. Hello. Uh, sorry, I, I wanted to explain uh, to more explanation about the connecting research and uh, what, what, yeah, connecting research and the researchers about this web. Anyone who can a little bit explain for me? 
So is, is, are you speaking of the one of the earlier slides I show with Nikki Nicholson? Uh, yeah, work? of course, because I am uh, sorry for, for you, my interruption. Uh, because I, I found it uh, now, the, the, the link. And I'm very interested in that one, yeah. Connecting okay. research and uh, researchers, the ORSID web. Yeah. So, uh, I'm, I'm not entirely certain what you might be referring to. And if anybody else has a sense of what that, what that is, um, then please step in. Could you write something in the, in the chat? You know, you, 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 you yeah. just... All right. Okay. Uh, okay. David, I'll, uh, uh, all right. David, I think she's referring to ORCID. Oh, uh, ORCID. Yes. The tagline uh, in ORCID uh, is connected yeah. researchers and research. Yeah, I tell you, my deepest apologies. Um, so mm. ORCID, uh, O-R-C-I-D dot org, mm. um, is a, an organization that has... Um, its arms in multiple nations now and multiple regions throughout the world. Um, it's positioned itself and it's a not-for-profit organization in the same sort of way that Crossref is for publications and the metadata about publications. Mm -hmm. ORCID, um, mm. and an ORCID ID for a person, um, um, attempts to um, give you, in essence, a handle for individuals um, that mm. are, is often now used in the, in the process of submitting grant applications. Oftentimes funding agencies will ask you, what's your ORCID identifier? Um, mm. Publications and journals now oftentimes require it of mm. both reviewers and authors. Um, and so it's become um, relatively well um, networked and integrated in a number of um, research spheres, if you will. Um, and it's HTTP, I'll put it in the chat there if, um, if no one has yet. The, uh, it's, uh, it's already posted, yeah. Already posted, there we go. Okay, um, thank you. Anybody else wanna say something about ORCID? I mean, that's just kind of what I know of it, but. Um, the one reason why I like it as a developer mm -hmm. is that it has, um, in addition to just, you know, assigning an identifier to an individual, it also has uh, opened up its doors in a programmatic sense where um, you can log in in the same sort of way that you oftentimes come across uh, log in via Google or log in via Twitter. And you, so you can use mm -hmm. your identity in that sense mm -hmm. in, in the same sort of way with ORCID. Uh, and mm. so you can authenticate in various web resources using your ORCID ID. Um, okay, uh, uh, leave. Thank you. One thing I always say about ORCID is you can make an ORCID and you can remain completely anonymous. Um, if you don't put any uh, disambiguating information in there, so if you don't say who your institution is or what university you work for, or you don't add a publication to it we still don't know that it's you um, it could be another person with exactly the same name as you so uh, for those of you who don't know my name is quite rare in English but mm. I found five other people in the world with the same name as me um, and that surprised me because I thought I would be unique and well, there's just too many people in the world <laughs> Um, but I think it's, we don't all have to manage our ORCID IDs perfectly um, and, and add all our publications to them, but they make it very simple for us. And you can just, you don't need to add them in manually. You can import them now um, from Crossref and things like that. So yeah. um, it's quite easy to do. Um, and, uh, you know, ORCID um, is doing its best to integrate um, very strongly with other entities such that, you know, it can be quite onerous to um, declare, oh, this is my publication, you know, tie it to your ORCID account, sort of give you an expression, almost like a, a running curriculum vitae of all your, of all your products. Um, but because ORCID is integrating very strongly with a number of publishers, well, that just automatically appears in your ORCID account when you use your ORCID ID to submit a manuscript, for example which is nice. 
And the same also, thing too with, also with David, data sets. when you review. Uh, so if you do something in the process of any of those, you also see that. Right. Thanks. This is it's kind of why one of the items on our to-do list um, included writing a three to four page, you know, um, statement about whether or not Tadwig um, should seek some kind of formal membership with ORCID. Um, um, because maybe within our community, um, there are a number of ways and places where this becomes very, very useful. Um, so e even in the authoring of um, items and submission for, for BIS, um, uh, submitting um, white papers for presentation on Tadwig, you know, et cetera, et cetera. All the kinds of activities that we're engaged in in Tadwig are you know, comparable to what you would expect in any kind of academic environment. Um, mm -hmm. So perhaps Tadwig as a, as a group, as an entity should think about uh, membership with ORCID. So that, that's a good mechanism, David, if, if you present a well three to four pager, we don't even necessarily need that much, but a rationale uh, then the executive can uh, take a look at that. And... Yeah. That's something that I think we could collaborate on with Tadwig um, from GBIF. We're also considering ORCID membership. Excellent. It's quite possible that ORCID has um, an arrangement that would allow a sort of cross-sharing of, um, of membership across uh, organizations. I, I don't know. In the same sort of way that um, Datasite is sort of positioning itself now in, it, in, its, um, in its strategy of having um, shared ownership over um, 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 membership. So um, if we do have five minutes, anybody, you know, Tim, you put out the suggestion that we should, I should do a quick demo of what Binomia is. Does anyone want to see that? How people use it? Well, I'll do one, I'll do one quickly. <laughs> if you said no, then well, I would just, you know, kick you out. <laughs> Um, let's see if I can uh, share my screen. Um, see my screen? Yes. Yeah, okay, good. Um, got too many tabs. So, um, So oh, here it is, um, I'm, I'm logged in at the moment. I used my ORCID and I logged in using the, you know, the, the OAuth pass-through that, that ORCID has. Um, and so I'm logged in with my account. Um, and when I do log in, what normally happens is that you, you get presented with your profile page. Um, and on it, will, if you've not done this before, when you log in, there's, there's nothing there because you've not gone through the exercise of, of finding your specimens that, that you're, you might have been associated with. So this kind of tackles the issue where in recorded by or identified by, it's nothing, oh, bunch of name strings in there for agents. Your name might be included in some of those specimens across the whole swath of GBIFS data, which I harvest every couple of weeks and refresh in Bionomia. And so you would then kind of go through your the specimen tab in your profile. And these are the ones that I found that were mine that I collected in doing some of my graduate work that identified these. This is my old colleague, Jaime Pinzon, um, uh, University of Alberta. And some of these little linifeid spiders that identified for him. And they're lodged at the University of Alberta Museum. I only like got three, it's pretty pitiful. <laughs> I'm sure there's more somewhere, but they've not yet been transcribed and digitized. They're sitting somewhere. Um, but here, is where you would have this discovered tab, where there's this whole mess of specimens that might have been yours. 
I've gone through the exercise of saying that's not mine, that's not mine, that's not mine. But then there's a little tick box here that says, let's make it less exact. So I've got some scoring happening behind the scenes that would, is looking at the structure of people's names and uh, coming up with a likelihood that some are yours and some are not yours. And sometimes it's a bit slow because here it found 106,000 of them. There's no way in hell I'm going to go through and say, that's not me, that's not me. So this is the importance of scoring some of these things. But here I've got you know, some short host JP. I have no idea who that is. Some Noctuids um, somewhere. Um, JD short host, that's my dad, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so in bulk, you can sort of, yeah, I collected that one or identified that one singly or in bulk up at the top here. Um, and you, you might think that, well, this is kind of ridiculous. Why would I spend my kind of time doing this? But once you start getting into a groove of going through this, you kind of think about, well, these are memories of the time that you're out in the field doing this. And it is immediately obvious when people start doing this that they're looking at those records and saying, uh-huh, there's a problem with that one. Um, that is me, but there's some other data in there that is erroneous. Um, and so this really bears, you know, um, stressing is that there's an opportunity here to engage people in the process of cleaning up data um, when they have an opportunity to look at their things. Um, or you can do it in bulk, right? Download a whole bunch of these candidate records that might be yours and you can do this in a spreadsheet and upload it so you don't have to click them one through at a time. So that's when you come in as a user and you look for your stuff. Um, but then there's an opportunity within this to um, um, find other people, you know, your graduate supervisor, your students, um, your long lost relative, um, somebody you might care about in some way. And so I've also wired it up to Wikidata um, for the deceased. Um, and um, here, wait at the top, help others. Um, so you can kind of find people by country. Um, see what's kind of happening here. Here's kind of this new people that were just included into Bionomia via ORCID or via Wikidata. So it kind of programmatically goes through this, um, both Wikidata and ORCID, and just draw in a whole bunch of people that have a particular um, likelihood that they are biologists in some way, shape, or form, or have collected specimens. Um, but here I can find somebody um, like Rich Pyle who's been participating in a number of our sessions, an ichthyologist out of um, Bishop's Museum in Hawaii. Um, and I can see all his specimens there. And I say, yeah, that's rich. That's not rich. <laughs> and that's his fish. That's not his fish. So here, this is obviously, there's a chromis. That's definitely rich. Um, and Rich has a public profile that he's made public. So it's your option. You can make it public or complete, keep it completely hidden. And in addition to that, um, I go twiddling through all of the downloaded uh, data sets that GBIF hosts on behalf of folk that have downloaded data um, and then go fishing for in those downloads, the, attribu the attributions that were made to those people. So I can say, here you go, here's 13 publications of that downloaded your specimen data and potentially use them in the analyses in that manuscript and say, well, what are those seven specimens that were in this particular paper for Rich? And up they come, <laughs> it's thinking. Um, uh, it's slow, there's too many of you on there right now. Um, anyway, but what would come up there is a, set, a list of seven specimens that, that might be associated with that, you know, that paper that was produced because of having downloaded specimen records from, from GBIF. Um, and because if you've made your email public in ORCID, I also kind of take that in um, via ORCID's API. And so I'll send you an email alert if you want it. Say, here's a new paper um, that made use of your specimens. Um, then there are a whole suite of folk that are engaged in doing this activity. And there's been at least 88 of us doing this. Um, some of us have spent hours and hours and hours of doing this, and it is just remarkable. Um, upwards of millions of linkages made between people 
either with an ORCID or a Wikidata identifier and, and specimens. And so wouldn't it be lovely we kind of close that loop, offer to collections an opportunity to download all those attributions made so that they can reincorporate them into their collections management systems. And that's what I'm doing here by also um, showing data sets. So these are the very same data sets that are in GBIF and, and offer um, the opportunity to then download these as frictionless data. Uh, and if you're not familiar with that one, I won't bore you with the details, but anyway, it's kind of like a Darwin Core archive, but it's uh, more expressive in terms of the many to many relationships. And so we have an agents table in that frictionless data package. And also within that are the attributions that would include things like the actions, you know, collected, identified. And so hopefully there's an opportunity to kind of seed this back into collections management systems. And so that we're going to close, trying to close the loop here um, and take full advantage of, of the people doing, doing this kind of work. David, we, we do need to wrap up now, actually. You, yeah. No, I'm done. That was great. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> So I hope that gives you kind of a flavor of what, what's going on there. Just while you're unsharing, Tim Robertson wanted to say something. Hey, I was just going to ask David, I mean, it's fabulous what you're doing. And I'd just like to repeat what I said on the chat. Your community of users have already linked two and a half percent of the specimens available through GBIF in your pet project. I mean, that's, that's remarkable. So well done. Do you see a role for GBIF to help mediate the outputs to the publishers? Could we help you? Yes, absolutely. I don't know what form that should take, um, but I'm desperate to find a way to get these going right back into the collections management systems, wherever they are coming from, um, to, to facilitate this whole, in essence, what's happening there is, is um, um, reconciling uh, those entries. And so Elspeth, as you're grappling with all these agents, you know, there's an opportunity to use what's coming out of here um, and help clean. That's yeah, my opinion. absolutely. Yeah. Anyway. So I hope everyone um, enjoyed that session. Um, um, and you've had an opportunity to um, think about the process of what it's like about making an extension to Darwin Core, um, the kinds of things that we've been thinking about. Uh, we have an appreciation for our 12 tasks in our task group um, and the things that we need to do yet. So I'm hopeful that maybe by the end of this year, early next year, we can have an agent's actions extension in production, not just test mode, um, but it will have to kind of dig through some of those comments in that Google Doc and translate them and push them into our GitHub repository and kind of tidy that up. Um, but I'm very pleased that you've had an opportunity to attend this uh, task group. Hopefully you can then think about other tasks that might fit within the interest group um, and consider um, participating in launching a new task group. So. Thanks. <laughs> hey, thank you, David. Cheers. That was great. Thank you. Bye.